Okay, um, so we're going to do another example here. This one is just going to be uh, pre-recorded, thrown up on YouTube. Um, I had five examples planned for the for the last uh, stream to class. Uh, we didn't get through all five. We did three of the five, which is still pretty good, I think. But um, I'll try to do a couple more as I have time. Um, here's one of them. We'll fit this one in. So here's a matrix, and one of the things that we want to point out right away on this matrix is we want to note note that A is symmetric. Okay, so A is a symmetric matrix, um, and remember that that means that A transpose is equal to A, right? And the way you can sort of tell that it's it's symmetric is you look at the um, you just kind of look at the. Well, I need a highlight tool. I don't have a highlight tool. Um, oh well. Uh, you know, you see that uh, that these entries match, those entries match, those entries match, right? Um, so that's that's the the symmetry there that we're talking about. Oops, <laughs> erase the whole thing. Zero, one, uh, one. Okay. Um, so it's a symmetric matrix, um, and one of the things that we talked about is that for any symmetric matrix, you can automatically, uh, you're guaranteed to be able to diagonalize, okay? And you're guaranteed that you'll be able to find real eigenvalues. Now, that doesn't mean they'll be nice necessarily. Uh, but they could be horrible, irrational things, but of course we've, we've chosen our matrix carefully to make sure that we get nice eigenvalues. Um, so let's find those eigenvalues. Start with the characteristic polynomial, okay? So we do the determinant of xi minus a. So that's going to be x minus 1, 0, minus 1, 0, x minus 1, 1, minus 1, 1, and x minus 2. Okay? And because the matrix is symmetric, it doesn't matter whether I expand along the first row or the first column, I'm going to get exactly the same thing. Um, of course, you get the same answer for any matrix, when you, whether you do row or column expansion. Um, but in this case, I just mean that you know the calculations will be the same. There's no benefit to doing one over the other because they will give me exactly the same thing. Okay, so x minus one times the uh, one one cofactor, right? Which is uh, this bit here, that cofactor, uh, and then we have zero in the middle, and then minus one times this cofactor, zero x minus 1, minus 1, and 1, okay? So, x minus 1 times x minus 1 times x minus 2, subtract 1, and then we have minus 1 times x minus 1, okay? So, common factor, x minus 1, so again we can we can factor by grouping, right? Um, I try to design these ones to make sure that we have nice factoring. So in that, in this set of parentheses here, let me just multiply that all out. I have x squared minus 3x plus 2 minus 1, and then minus 1 more, okay? So I get x minus 1 times x squared minus 3x, all those constants cancel. So I have x, x minus 1, x minus 3. Okay, so there's my characteristic polynomial. The roots of that polynomial are my eigenvalues. So I know that my eigenvalues are lambda equals 0, lambda is equal to 1, and lambda is equal to 3. Okay. Um, now, some people get concerned when they see zero as an eigenvalue, right? Because uh, we make a big deal about the fact that when we write down this eigenvalue equation, right? This eigenvalue equation, a times x is equal to lambda times x. Um, we we require that x be non-zero, right? X has to be non-zero. Um, but there's nothing saying lambda can't be zero. And in fact, um, if we think about what it means to say that zero is an eigenvalue, right? Um, Let's think about what that. We'll do that one first. So let's do, let's do the lambda equals zero. There will be our first one. Um, so what does that mean? 
Well, that means that you know we just have you know a minus zero times the identity, so we just have a, right? Um, and so we're solving. We're just solving this equation: a times x is equal to zero, right? Um, now the fact that we can find a non-trivial solution to that equation, uh, well, what that tells me is that a is not invertible, right? Um, and that kind of makes sense because if you go back to the characteristic polynomial, right? Uh, if you if you put x equals zero in the characteristic polynomial, what you get is determinant of a, or in this case, it would be minus determinant of a, right? Um, so notice that uh, let me just point that out up here, right? That c a of zero is just the determinant of minus a, but in this case, c a of zero is also zero, so that means the determinant is zero. So zero determinant, we know that means the matrix is not invertible, and that's why we know we can find a non-zero solution to this equation. So let's find it. Oops. Okay, and we'll go ahead and find that equation. So the way we solve is we write down that coefficient matrix, which in this case is just the matrix 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, minus 1, minus 1, 2, and we do row operations to reduce. So first row operation I'll do is row 3 minus row 1 into row 3. 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, minus 1, 0, minus 1, 1. And then I'm going to do row 3 plus row 2. Oops. Row 3 plus row 2 into row 3. Okay. 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, minus 1, 0, 0, 0. Sorry, this keeps moving on me. Um, okay, that's in reduce or echelon form. So, if I have a times x equal to 0, and if x is equal to, say, x1, x2, x3, what that tells me, right, so that first row says uh, 1 times x1, 0, x2, 1, x3, um, remember it's homogeneous, so that should be equal to 0. So the first row says that x1 should be minus x3. Uh, second row says x2 minus x3 is equal to 0, so x2 is x3, x3 is free. Um, so for now I'm going to put x3 equal to 1. We might change that later, but for now let's say x3 is going to be 1 and so my first eigenvector is minus 1, 1, 1. Okay? And you can go ahead and check that if you take a times x you do indeed get 0. Okay? Um, I'll skip that, but it's an easy exercise for you to do. So there's our eigenvector corresponding to the eigenvalue of 0. So now, let's do the next one. Lambda is equal to 1. Okay, what do we get for lambda is equal to 1? Well, a minus 1i is going to look like so it's going to be 1 minus 1, 0, 1, 0, 1 minus 1, um, oops, sorry, uh, minus 1, and then 1 minus 1, 2 minus 1. Okay, so that's 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, minus 1, 1, minus 1, 1. Okay, and after a couple of row operations, we can get that down to here. Okay, so that's my 
getting it down to reduce row echelon form. Okay, it's a couple. It's it's only about three row operations. Uh, move the third row up to the top. Um, notice that we can cancel those first two rows. Obviously, we cancel right. We add row one to row two, and the the ones cancel. Give me the row zeros, um, and then I can use that leading one in the third column to make a zero uh, in in this entry here. Okay. All right. So. Um, Good. There's our reducer echelon form. So this time, if I said, let's use maybe y. Okay. So if I say uh, a minus i times y is equal to zero, and y is equal to maybe y one, y two, y three. My equations tell me well that first row says y one minus y two is equal to zero. So y one has to equal y two. And y3 has to be 0, right? 0, 0, 1. So this, this row here says y3 has to be 0. Okay. So uh, if I put y2 equal to 1, that's going to give me 1, 1, 0 for my second eigenvector. Okay. Um, and if you go multiply uh, that vector by the original matrix A, you will find that you do indeed get the vector 1, 1, 0. So it works. It has that eigenvalue of, of 1. Okay. And so the last eigenvalue was 3. So let's see what that looks like. Lambda equals 3. Okay. So A minus 3i will be... 1 minus 3, 0, 1, 0, 1 minus 3, minus 1, 1, minus 1, 2, minus 3. So I get minus 2, 0, 1, 0, minus 2, minus 1, 1, minus 1, 1. I'm oh, sorry, minus 1. Okay. So, um, Maybe what I'll do is I'll take that bottom row and move it up to the top. 1 minus 1 minus 1. 0 minus 2 minus 1. Okay. So here we just swapped row 1 with row 3. Uh, then I'll take row 3 and I'll add to row 1. 1 minus 1 minus 1. 0 minus 2, minus 1, 0, um, minus 2, minus 1. And so then I'm going to do row 3 minus row 2 into row 3. Okay. That's going to get me to 1, minus 1, minus 1, 0, minus 2. Minus 1, 0, 0, 0. Now I'm going to do minus 1 half row 2 to row 2. One, minus 1, minus 1, 0, 1, 1 half, 0, 0, 0. And the last step is to do row 1 plus row 2 into row 1. 1, 0, minus 1 plus a half. Oops. There's a there's a hidden scroll bar that my my hand keeps hitting. Zero, one, one half. There's my reducer of echelon form. Okay. So if I take say let's call the third eigenvector Z, where Z is gonna be maybe Z one z2, z3. Um, then row 1 says that z1 is 1 half z3. The second row says z2 is minus 1 half z3. z3 is free. So if I let z3 equal to um, 2, 
then I get 1 minus 1 2 okay for that last vector all right so I found my eigenvalues and my my eigenvectors so let's just kind of recap our matrix was 1 0 1 0 1 minus 1 minus 1 2 eigenvalues are lambda equals 0, lambda equals 1, lambda equals 3. The corresponding eigenvectors are x equal to, I'm going to go back up, I don't remember what it was. There it is, minus 1, 1, and 1. y y was 1 1 0 1 1 0 z is 1 minus 1 2 okay now uh, I want to point out a couple more things that are kind of cool with this one uh, because the matrix is symmetric Here is an extra property that we get just because the matrix is symmetric. If I do x dot y, I get minus 1 plus 1 plus 0, I get 0. If I do x dot z, I get minus 1 minus 1 plus 2, which is 0. And if I do x, sorry, if I do y dot z, I get uh, 1 minus 1 plus 0, I get 0, right? Um, so that means that this set of vectors, x, y, z, um, is an orthogonal set. Um, let me just quickly, uh, I mean, I know this is going to add to the length of the video, but let me point out why an orthogonal set of vectors is really cool. Um, suppose I give you, suppose I give you the following vector. Let's call it, um, I don't know, v for vector. And let's just pick, I don't know, one, two, three. Keep it cool. Uh, keep it simple. Okay. Um, so we take v, and we're going to write v as say c1 times x. So we always have this problem of, if I have a vector, is it possible to write that vector as a linear combination of the, uh, of the three vectors that I have, right? And, and typically this involves solving a system of equations, right? We would set up this system where the, the coefficient matrix would be, oops, somehow I zoomed that, I didn't mean to do that. Um, the coefficient matrix there, would be we have this coefficient matrix p which has the columns one minus one 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 zero one oops sorry mine one minus one and two right and so essentially we'd be trying to solve you know we would take that as our um, our coefficient matrix, we'd form the augmented matrix with the 1, 2, 3 over on the right hand side. We do our row operations, try to reduce and solve for the scalars, C1, C2, C3. Um, but because of this orthogonality property, notice what I can do. If I did x dot v, well that's going to be equal to x dotted with C1 x plus C2 y plus C3 z, okay? And so that's C1 times x dot x, C2 times x dot y, C3 times x dot z, just using properties of the dot product. Um, now x dot v, we can just do that, right? What is x dot v? Um, here's x, here's v, so I'm going to get um, minus 1 
plus 2 plus 3. So 5 minus 1. So that number is just 4. 4 is equal to C1 times x dot x. So x dotted with itself, that's just the magnitude squared. Uh, I'm going to get 1 squared times plus 1 squared plus 1 squared. I get 3, right? But the other two dot products are 0. So now I know that C1 is 4 over 3, OK? Um, and then kind of using the same reasoning, we can say, well, similarly, C2 must be equal to, um, we just dot both sides now, this time by y, and we find that C2 would be y dot v over y dot y. All right, so I do y dot v, I get 3 over 2, and C3 would be z dot v over z dot z. Notice these look kind of like projection formulas, right? Um, and z dot v, here's my z, here's my v. So I do that dot product, I get 1 minus 2 plus 6. Uh, that's 5. z dot z is 1 squared plus 1 squared plus 2 squared, 6. OK? So I get that. All right? Um, and then, and now I, I have my scalars, right? So I can actually write it out, C1, right? So C1 is just going to be this. This is 4 thirds. C2 is 3 over 2. C3 is 5 over 6, right? No row operations, solving systems, just dot products. This is why we like orthogonal sets of vectors, right? They're super easy to work with. Um, even better is an orthonormal set of vectors. So often what we want to do is, is we want to We want to normalize. And, and so we will replace x with this vector a. So a will be 1 over the magnitude of x times x. So that's going to be 1 over root 3 times minus 1, 1, 1. OK. Um, b will be 1 over length of y times y, which will be 1 over root 2 times 1, 1, 0, and c, the vector c, 1 over the length of z times z will be 1 over root 6 times 1 minus 1, 2, OK? Um, and so what we're going to do is instead of using, instead of using this one here, we're going to use this matrix, P. So P is going to be the matrix whose columns are the vectors A, B, C. So that's going to be the following. Minus 1 over root 3, 1 over root 3, 1 over root 3. Okay. And then 1 over root 2, 1 over root 2, 0. 1 over root 6, minus 1 over root 6, 2 over root 6, OK? And one of the things that you can check is that P transpose is actually equal to P inverse, OK? It's a pretty easy computation to check. And, and the ne next thing that you can check is that if I do P transpose times A times P, I should get a diagonal matrix where the diagonal entries are my eigenvalues, 0, 1, and 3. OK? Um, we can actually confirm that. Um, and in fact, it's now, this video is already too long. And watching me do all those calculations by hand is going to make it even longer. So let me show you how we can use the computer to sort of assist us in doing this. Um, so I'm going to go over to here. Here's the Sage Cell server. Um, Sa now, Sage Math, by the way, Sage is an open source um, computer algebra system. It does a lot of the same stuff that, say, Mathematica or Maple would do, but it's completely free. 
uh, and Sage actually incorporates a lot of other open um, programming systems like Python and R. Uh, there's a lot of that stuff that's all built in. So you'll notice that I've, I've actually put in the matrix A there. I'm going to enter that matrix P that we just came up with as well. Okay, so here's the, the syntax, right? There's a couple different syntaxes for entering these, but I'll use this one. So we had 1 divided by square root of 3. Um, this is, and by the way, I'm, I'm actually using Python. I'm not using Sage. Um, Sage understands Python. Square root of 2, 1 over square root of 6. I hope this works. Uh, I think that's the right command for square roots. Uh, and then... And then it was root 3, 1 over root 2, minus 1 over root 6. Oh, and there's that minus sign in the first one. Did I get that? No. Minus. Okay. Down to the end. So 1 over square root of 3, 1 over square root of 2, minus 1 over square root of 6. Okay, there's a second row third row was, um, let's come back, 1 over root 3, 0, and then 2 over root 6. Okay, 0, 2 over root 6. Okay. Alright, and now let's just check that, that it understands those two matrices, A and P. How are we doing? Ha! There! Right? It works. Now, uh, let me check a couple more things for you. Let me check what do I get if I do p times um, transpose is done like this p dot t uh, is how you do a transpose in Python if I remember right. Ha! See? p times p transpose is the identity. That's how I know that p transpose is the inverse, right? And if, if p times something is the identity, you know that something is the inverse. Okay, and let's do one more product here. Um, let's do p transpose times a times p, and see what we get. There it is, right? There's that diagonal matrix, eigenvalues: the zero, the one, the three, down the diagonal. Uh, it's exactly what we expect to see, right? Um, and so one of the reasons why it's useful to be able to diagonalize is if I wanted to calculate something like let's say I wanted to calculate um, like a to the seventh power okay um, well a I can rearrange so if I call this thing D I can rearrange that equation to say well a is P times D times P transpose raised to the seventh power and if you multiply it all out, remember that that means p times d times p transpose, and then p times d times p transpose, and so on, seven times. Um, all the inside p times p transposes are just the identity. They cancel out, and you end up with p times d to the 7 times p transpose. And so this actually gives you a really efficient way of, of calculating a to the 7th, because um, d to the 7 would just be... 0, 0, 0, 0. So 0 to the 7th power is 0. 1 to the 7th power is still 1. 0, 0. And then, okay, so 3 to the 7, I'm just going to leave as 3 to the 7. That's some really big number um, that we're not going to try to write out. Um, but you could work out that that's d to the 7th. Uh, and then you multiply by p and p transpose, and that gives you a to the 7, which is much easier than trying to multiply a by itself 7 times, right? Um, that's the idea. Um, okay, uh, that's all I wanted to tell you about this example. Um, I know this video is a little bit long. It's really hard to do a short video on eigenvalues and eigenvectors, um, but hopefully that uh, covers a lot of the details that you might need to see.